Well, a very warm welcome to everyone who's been able to join us this afternoon as we start the final week of our summer 2022 bite-sized corrosion series. Now, during these few weeks, we've been exploring some of the hidden dangers of cathodic protection. And last week, we looked at the dangers associated with too much cathodic protection, both in the presence of AC power lines or AC interference, and if we have too much cathodic protection, what that does in terms of impacting our coatings. So Neil, welcome back to Johannesburg after your time away. And I thought today, uh, whilst we've explored some of the risks of turning up our CP, let's look at some of the challenges that can happen when we're running our CP system within the correct and normal parameters. Now, if I know anything about CP, we need to be looking at electrical continuity, and I think that can be somewhat of a challenge. Yes, cathodic protection being an electrical system, you cannot have an electrical circuit if it is not continuous. And so in the cathodic protection systems that we're dealing with, we have to ensure that the electrical path is continuous. Now, we know from our circuit theory of series and parallel circuits that whatever current is generated by a source has to return to that source no matter which way it goes. So if there's more than one path available, it's going to share between those paths, but it's always going to get back to the source. The, so, so that's sounding a little bit like interference currents. Well, yes, very much so. So the, we've in previous series spoken quite extensively about stray currents from outside sources, such as railway lines and things like that, and the effect that that can have on our pipelines and structures. But the same principle applies within a structure in terms of electrical continuity. And also, it is possible that we can pick up a current from somebody else's cathodic protection system. So by that, we then saying that someone else's CP system can do damage to my pipeline. Oh, absolutely. So if you have got two pipelines which um, are in close proximity to each other, in theory, they should both be cathodically protected by their own systems and everything should be fine. However, it is possible that you can have a situation where you have one pipeline that has cathodic protection and another pipeline in the vicinity does not have cathodic protection. And then you find that the potential gradients associated with the cathodic protection system can be deleterious to other structures. And by that, I mean generally pipelines, but other things can, any steel structure that's buried is at risk. And those fields can then set up currents in our structure, stray currents, as we have seen before. And perhaps it's better illustrated if I show a little graphic here, courtesy of Manusman and one of their very excellent publications. Here we have a graphic where the green pipeline is cathodically protected and it is connected through an impressed current cathodic protection system over there to a remote anode bed. Associated with that anode bed then is a gradient in the ground, an electrical field gradient, which can intersect other structures. So if we then look at the blue pipeline in this picture, we can see that the current which is exiting or leaving the anode, up the pipeline, travel along the pipeline and then discharge in the area of our protected pipeline. And this red area that is illustrated here then suffers from what we call anodic interference. In other words, it is polarized or shifted in the positive direction and corrosion occurs, just as we have the same situation occurring with stray currents from traction systems. With the congestion of servitudes, the numbers of pipelines, particularly in urban areas, I would envisage that this would be quite a common occurrence. And to the best of my knowledge, the Electrolysis Commission here in South Africa, and in fact around the world, 
uh, aren't you supposed to work together with them to try and prevent this from occurring? Yes, absolutely. The Other Crosses Commission was set up in the 1960s, initially to primarily address the issues associated with straight current interference from railway lines, but um, it also is intended to coordinate cathodic protection work between different pipeline owners. To a large extent, the systems are balanced by means of cross-bonding. So for example, in this graphic, if we had a, an electrical bond between the blue pipeline and the green pipeline, then current would flow in that bond instead of flowing through the ground. And we wouldn't have this problem of anodic interference, which can cause corrosion of the pipeline in the vicinity of a cathodically protected structure. That's the theory, but are there examples of pipelines locally here in South Africa where there have been this kind of challenge because my pipeline's running through somebody else's um, ground bed? Yes, um, we've had it happen both ways, where in one case, somebody installed a pipeline in the vicinity of somebody else's ground bed, and the net result was that the new pipeline suffered from extensive interference corrosion. It became a sieve within about two years, just as a result, because the pipeline had been laid. It was a new pipeline. It had a very good coating system. There was obviously mechanical damage during construction, as there always is. And the interference from the other CP system caused the, the newly installed pipeline to corrode and perforate very rapidly. In another situation, we had a, an operational pipeline and fortunately we had some wide awake pipeline inspectors and they noticed that somebody was digging. And lo and behold, all of a sudden, right next to their pipeline within spitting distance appeared a long trench excavation, anode bed, and CP system about to be installed. This was then sorted out, fortunately, through the Electrolysis Commission contacts because they were able to identify whose pipeline it was that they were installing this anode bed. And they went to them and said, hey, you can't put that anode bed here. You're right next to my pipeline and you're going to cause interference. And the situation was resolved. I think sometimes there's a problem with the issuing perhaps of permits or uh, servitude rights because the, the, the presumably area of government issuing servitudes don't necessarily understand what is a ground bed and what the implications are of a pipeline traversing uh, an existing ground bed or between a ground bed and its parent pipe. And I'm sure there are also examples where you've got two pipes in close proximity. There must be examples where two pipes in close proximity have caused corrosion on each other. The Electrolysis Commission norms, if I can call it that, used to be such that anybody in planning to install a new CP system would notify the other operators of their intentions so that the various operators would know a, to monitor their systems, they'd be able to say, hey, hang on, you can't do that because I'm already there, I got there first, and so on. But unfortunately, due to attrition in the effectiveness of the commission, a lot of this is not happening because a lot of the pipeline operators do not have internal cathodic protection departments anymore. I mean, there used to be a time when every major operator had a cathodic protection division. And to a large extent, those have fallen away because of lack of the perceived need for these departments. And there's also loss of corporate memory. So the old gentleman knew where the ground bed was, and, and that's not genderist, but they're usually women. And, and the new incoming people are still finding their feet and don't know all of that information. And perhaps the GIS of today will help future generations, but, but we do have a little bit of a gap in the knowledge from sort of yesteryear to now. Yeah, the GIS is great, as long as the data is entered into the GIS and people refer to it. Do you have any photographs of, of corrosion that has occurred as a direct result of this sort of interference? 
Well, yes, we had a, a particularly graphic example of a pipeline that was installed, which actually crossed a new pipeline that was installed, crossed an existing pipeline. There was some coating damage in the area of the crossing. There you can see this is now after the offending piece of pipe had been extracted from the ground because you'll see why in a moment. And there was some coating damage and this coating damage had in fact corroded right through the pipe, as you can see from that. So that's a pretty graphic example of through wall corrosion which had occurred at a point where a newly installed pipeline was crossing an existing pipeline with cathodic protection and there was no attempt made to protect the new pipeline during construction and the interference actually caused this level of corrosion to occur. And that happened over a period of about nine months. That's quite scary that installing a new pipeline the best will in the world, and I don't put in um, temporary cathodic protection, that, that there's enough current that can actually cause that amount of damage. That's quite a sobering consideration. Well, yes, you know, we, we had some interaction with an international project manager, construction corporation, um, a few years back where we were talking about the need for temporary cathodic protection. They said, oh, well, well, yeah, what's the problem? I mean, we, we normally install our pipes and after a couple of years, we check what's going on and then we do something about it. Well, that's a bit long to wait when you get corrosion happening at a much greater rate. And it's quite easy to understand how this can happen because we have a general principle that a one amp of direct current will consume about... 10 kilograms of steel per year. Now, if you concentrate all of that into a small defect like the size of your thumbnail, you're going to land up with 100 microamps. Now, that's 0.1 of a milliamp. An, an LED takes 3 milliamps. So 0.1 of a milliamp will cause a millimeter per year of metal loss. That's so, very little current causing very lot of damage. Uh -huh. And in terms of perforation, if you've got a 10 millimeter wall pipe, one milliamp, which is still nowhere near our LED current, will perforate that in a year. If you take an amp and think about the straight current situation from railways, there's, where there's hundreds or thousands of amps, one amp will perforate, can perforate a pipe in nine hours. Those are theoretical numbers. But we have seen perforation occurring in as little as three months. And generally, these sort of uh, situations result in perforation within two years, if there is an interference scenario. Putting some numbers to it and shrinking it to the size of my thumbnail starts to make me take a little bit of a closer look at what currents are flowing where and why. Literally a hidden, a hidden danger, but now that we know about it, it's been brought into the light. So Absolutely. we can keep an eye open for it. Now, Neil, we've spoken about interference between two pipelines and I know that there can be challenges within a pipeline so we're talking about on our own pipeline and we want electrical continuity to give us this this path but we know we spoke a couple of uh, sessions back about vandalism and the breaking of continuity bonds that's also a cause of concern isn't it very much so the current that is flowing in the pipeline as, as a result of the cathodic protection system, if it comes across a break in electrical continuity, so for example, a Viking Johnson coupling or a buried flange, and contrary to a lot of popular belief, a buried bolted flange is not necessarily electrically conductive or electrically continuous. So we've said that the current wants to get back to its source. So it comes to this break in continuity and says, right, where else can I go? Well, it can go through the soil or it can go through the water in the case of a water pipeline if there happen to be um, breaks in the lining of the pipeline. But the more common issue is external. And this um, image here is of a situation where a section of pipeline 
was left out of the cathodic protection system. And the adjacent section of pipeline had cathodic protection on it. There was a small thumbnail sized defect in the coating. We had a result of 90% metal loss um, <laughs> within three months. So that can uh, be quite catastrophic. That was an, on an impressed current system. But even some of the older pipelines, which were installed perhaps without cathodic protection or bonding, so these were relatively small diameter pipes laid with Viking Johnson couplings. And this particular example is a situation where a pipeline was laid through varying soil conditions with Viking Johnson couplings and no continuity bonding. And just the inline currents in the pipe resulting from the differences in soil characteristics was enough to cause corrosion of the pipe adjacent to the coupling. And you can clearly see where the coupling steel was um, in contact with the pipe and it caused corrosion in the section of the pipe that was actually then exposed to the soil. This took 15 years to perforate. So per perforation will happen, but it might take time. Uh -huh. and, and that actually just raises a thought in my mind this pipe did not have cathodic protection. So that's the danger of not having cathodic protection could Correct. cause this, but actually it's the lack of electrical continuity that, that was the precipitating force. Yes. And Neil, one of the concerns I have is for ease of installation, a number of pipelines now are being installed as jointed pipes, much easier, and I, I fully get that to install. But that does raise a challenge particularly with cathodic protection, because you want electrical continuity. But what about the scenario where we install a jointed pipe and say we only need what we call hotspot corrosion protection. So just in the low lying areas, we want to put in a few anodes. How, how great is the risk of causing this sort of continuity related interference? Well, that depends on what kind of, of CP you're installing. If you're putting in sacrificial anodes, the, the risk of the interference across a, a non-continuous joint is much greater because the potential gradients in the ground are much greater with impressed current systems. But even with sacrificial anode systems, if you were to install a sacrificial anode system, it has a a field of influence of maybe several hundred meters. Mm -hmm. And one needs to do the attenuation calculations very carefully so that you design the system that the effect of the anode will have dissipated by the time you get to the end of the bonded section. You don't want the anodes to go all the way up to the end of the bonded section because then at the first a uh, break in, in continuity, you're going to land up with this exact same problem. So that is a challenging design function that should be undertaken if you are going to do hot hotspot protection on a jointed pipe. And in a sense, the, the importance of this is to prevent kind of self-inflicted corrosion where the pipe corrodes itself because of something within itself or obviously within the, the design of the CP system. And, and that is very easy to understand for me anyway, how in a hotspot scenario, uh, you can get that kind of self-inflicted corrosion. But I know there's a story associated with your next picture about a self-inflicted corrosion scenario, yeah, which well, that, I think people would be interested in. I think this is my favorite pipe, pipeline HIV story. This is a pontoon from a floating barge and the barge was linked to the shore by means of an umbilical cord which was supported on pontoons and the pontoons su supported the uh, the various pipes power supplies a, a walkway for pedestrian access and so on the, the operators of this particular system had installed a cathodic protection system on the barge which was very good good practice and all the rest of it and being quite innovative they put the anodes on the shore because it was easier than 
putting the barge up on dry docks uh, where they have to replace the sacrificial anodes every few years. The problem was that this uh, series of pontoons was not electrically continuous and it was in a direct line between the anode bed and the barge. And the pontoons themselves were not electrically bonded either to each other or to the barge. So the current from the ground bed went onto the first pontoon and then it played hop, skip and jump all the way leapfrogging to the barge. And yes, there was some sort of spurious contact through some of the links, but several of these pontoons actually corroded and they all corroded on in the same place. They corroded on the corner closest to the barge. And everybody said, oh, what's wrong with the coating on this, that, and the next thing? Meanwhile, it, it was the corrosion protection system of the barge causing corrosion of its own umbilicals. Kind of leaves me with the sinking feeling, if we could say. I, I can't imagine how devastated they must have been when, when it came to light. Thank you, Neil. I think that's really just highlighted some other concerns that we need to be aware of and that we need to take cognizance when designing our own CP systems to make sure we're not causing similar self-inflicted damage because we haven't sought through the issues properly, but also that we take into account what is in the vicinity. And it's really important that we, we do take good cognizance of other pipelines in the area, uh, other CP systems in the area, that we, we don't try and work in complete isolation. Now, as we're closing off, just a, a quick reminder that we'll be coming back tomorrow to look at a few more hidden dangers associated with cathodic protection uh, to close off this series. So really just to say a big thank you for joining us today for our discussion on some hidden dangers associated with cathodic protection. I think it's always helpful when we are reminded of risks uh, in any scenario. And hopefully this has reminded you of some risks to keep uh, in the forefront of your mind if you are in the uh, process of designing a new pipeline or refurbishing a pipeline, just some of the things that you need to keep your eyes open for. Thank you so much for joining us. And we do hope that you will join us again tomorrow when we wrap up this discussion on the hidden dangers of cathodic protection. And we do so look forward to your joining us. Have a wonderful afternoon further. Thanks and goodbye.